Hey guys, welcome back. It is Kevin Powell here with the podcast, and it's Incarceration Fest time. It's that fever that we all feel around summertime. We're waiting. We we want that itch to be scratched, right? So Incarceration Fest was there last year. I'm back again this year, and I got all kinds of bands to talk to. Like today, I have Matt from Ashes to New. Matt, how are you doing today? How you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing, doing good. good. Uh, so you're over in yeah. Pennsylvania. I'm over in West Virginia. Um, first off, how does it feel to be part of this year's incarceration? We were there last year. We weren't supposed to be. That's what um, I thought. But they That's asked us last second. They were like, hey, do you guys want to fill in for, I guess, a band dropped off last year and like our entire tour package was there. And we're like, I mean, feels good every year you play it, right? So, I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, we're stoked to be back. We had, had we had talked to them last year and we're like, hey, you know, don't let us, uh, you know, fill in this year, ruin our chances for coming back next year. And they didn't. So here we are. We're going back, man. And it's a... Uh, it's one of the best festivals out there right now, man. It's a lot of fun to play. Absolutely. I thought I, I saw you guys last year in passing. And then when I saw it on the lineup this year, I was like, aha, okay. So I'm glad you clarified that. So thank you for that. Um, what can fans really expect from your performance at this year's incarceration? Same thing as every year, man. Energy. We bring energy. You know, people ask the questions like, how do you do that and perform live, man? Like we're conditioned, you know, bring the highest energy we can. And, uh, you know, I mean, the crowd's going to be energetic, right? You know, um, that's actually one of the benefits of playing like earlier in the days. You know, everyone's still got all that that rage, man. They haven't got it out yet. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, we do our best up on stage to make sure we can we can start that fire up, man. Get everyone flowing. Well, how do you prepare for a festival on this size um, in comparison to maybe like a regular concert? Same thing, man. I don't think that we I don't think we approach anything any differently. Let's go out there and crush it. Rip it up, dude. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> that's the way to go. You know, okay, awesome. Bring, bring the A game and uh, keep your fingers crossed. There's no technical difficulties, man. So you know what I mean. That's that's, that's the biggest thing. Yeah, I will say. Um, was last year the first year you guys were on? Where have you ever been with uh, the DWP um, team before? Oh yeah, man. We've been doing. So we did incarceration. The first time we did it was in 2018. Okay. Um. That may have been like I, that may have been one of the first years for it. I'm not. I'm not sure. It has, hadn't been around for very long. At least that sounds DW. right. I don't even know if DWP owned it that year. I don't think they did. Um, but I mean, we've done we've done the Wimmer Fest for, you know, we've been doing them since 2015. So you know, jumping in and out, and we're back when Rock on the Range was Rock on the Range, and Carolina uh -huh. Rebellion still existed, and you know all that stuff. So. <laughs> So I, I bring that up. I was at incarceration last year, and that was my first incarceration. And I will say, so I've had my fair share of festivals. I've had my fair share of concerts, just like you and everybody else that's probably watching or listening to this. Some are good. Some are ran very well, and some are not. <laughs> I was very impressed with just the professionalism across the board. And that's not me sucking up to the team. It's like, for real, you guys do a good job. So I'm sure you guys are taken very good care of, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, we experience it too, right? And not only do we experience it on our end with when a festival is run really well or when it's run really poorly, like we hear it from the fans as well. And I'll be honest with you, the empath in me hates it for the fans more than it hates it for me. Because even though I might be dealing with a terrible situation in the backside of the festival in the backstage area, it's, it's way different for the fans. You know what I mean? Like it's – you guys are out there in the heat all day long and, and it's, you know, if it rains, it's like, where do you go? Now there's mud, which some people take pleasure in that, you know, you get the mud and, you know, it turns into a completely different thing. You guys are on the other side of it, man. And, and, um, I have, I have experienced poor, poorly ran festivals. I, and I'll give you one, to be honest with you. We played uh well, we were supposed to play a festival called uh rebel rock. And this was a big thing in 2021. Um, they just straight up canceled it on everybody and didn't really give a good reason as to why they canceled it on everybody. Um, although, you know, you hear so many different reasons. I don't know what the real reason was. I know that I heard like four or five different reasons, but we had already driven there. Like, uh, the bus had already gone there. Um, and it was one of them scenarios. It's like, well, what do we do now? Like, we just made this whole trip and they're like, yeah, we're not paying you. So they didn't pay the bands either. And they're like, yeah, we're not paying you. Um, actually what, what they did do is, is they wrote us a check in and it bounced. Um, and then, and then, you know, so then we're playing the paying the bounce fee, but, um, so we did a, we did a pop-up show. We found a venue 
in Orlando um, that was willing to have us come in and turn their it wasn't a stage. It was like an area that could be a stage, turn that into a stage. And we offered anybody who had, um, rebel rock tickets, free entry to just come in and enjoy the show. And, you know, it was one of the, at that point, it was the biggest merch night we had ever had. Um, and the place was packed. You couldn't, you couldn't fit any more people in there. And that was just within like 30 minutes of letting people know on social media, Hey, this is happening right down the road. So, I mean, we turned a bad into a good, but yeah, bad festival stuck. More of the story. <laughs> <laughs> I love the story. That was a good story. Um, the show must go on, as they say. And yeah, you guys can prove that you know it will and must go on. So it sounds like you have quite a lot of experience with shows and festivals and just years and years and years and years of all this stuff. And that's great. Can you share any maybe funny or interesting behind the scenes stories from previous festival performances, rather it be incarceration or something else? Yeah, I mean, so like in 2015, so I, so I'm sober, by the way, and I'll start the story with that. So I'm sober, and in 2015, I wasn't. Um, and we played Rock on the Range for the first time, and I got absolutely annihilated. Um, it was when they had the, the artist lounge, and everyone was just like in that artist lounge partying all night long. And I got absolutely hammered. Um, and like, I got calls from management like the next day and everything. And they're like, what did you do last night? What happened? I'm like, what do you mean? And they're like, oh, we got a call from, you know, upper level management of the festival. Like you were acting like a crazy asshole oh, or geez. whatever. <laughs> so anyway, I mean, that kind of like, I didn't really get the ins and outs of that. I had heard, and I'm not going to throw this artist under the bus, but I had heard that another artist was not fond of my behavior. And okay. from what I understand, come to find out is this artist is just a, um, for lack of better words, a bitch. Um, and um, so anyway, they weren't fond of my behavior and they had, they had complained about it. So the so from that point until the next time I had gone there, which I think it was like two years later or something, I had gotten sober. Um, so I went there that year and everyone like, we got back to the artist lounge and everyone comes out and they're like, yo, dude, man, like we throwing down this year. Like I'm talking like a group of people. We're like, yo, let's go, man. Like, let's. <laughs> Like everyone is just excited, man. Like they're excited to see me. They're ready to party. And I'm like, God, I don't party. And they're like, wait, what? Like you were, you were a party animal last time, man. Like you were not, and everyone was ready to throw down. And they're like, what happened? And I, I told them, it, you know, it wasn't that experience. It was obviously a lot of different things that made me find my sobriety. But um, I told them about that experience. It was a little traumatic to me because I had never done anything like that before. Um, and they're like, dude, what are you talking about? Like you were the life of the party. We had the best time. So, you know, it turned out that it was just that dude being a bitch and I really didn't do anything that was terrible. Um, I didn't think that I did and I, and I really didn't, but, uh, but yeah, you know, sometimes it can get kind of crazy behind the scenes. Well, Hey, thanks for sharing that with me, Matt. Um, I'm yeah, straight man. edge, so I can be right there with you. So yay us. Hell yeah, man. Let's go. Let's go. Um, so Feels sticking good. with, sticking with a little bit more, um, on the personal side of things, um, what are some of your personal favorite songs to perform live and why? Oh, that's always we get that question a lot in VIP. That's really difficult, man, because it kind of it kind of changes, right? It depends on my mood. Um, I really love performing my name live because um, it's a very deep song to me. Uh, Heartache. That's also a very deep song. So, like when they're that deep, I can really get into them emotionally more. Um, but I mean, like the whole set, like, and it just kind of varies, either you know, show to show or tour to tour, and it really depends on what the crowd's reactions are to the songs too. Like, you know, do I look out in the crowd and do I see somebody who's who's who is you know singing or rapping along with me with tears in their eyes? Like, is that happening? You know what I mean? Because like I know that feeling on the other end when you're listening to a song that hits you so deep that you're like can't help yourself but let all the emotions out. So if I see somebody doing that, that becomes my favorite song of the night. You know what I mean? So like, it's really hard to pick one. If I had to, and I was forced to do it, I'd probably have to pick two or three. I'd go Heartache, My Name, and Panic. Okay. All great songs. Thanks for sharing that as well. Um, I'm sure sometimes, depending on where you're playing, your set list might change to maybe cater to that crowd. Um, I've seen that um at sonic temple this year i don't know if you were there or if you've seen any of the bands that were playing but some of the bands i was excited to see didn't play their heaviest songs and that's okay it's not my show it's everybody's show um had a lot of fun watching bands play at sonic temple excited for incarceration this year all dwp things um when did when did the band kind of get started what year did that start 
Well, we started in 2013. Okay. But just to touch base on what you just said, we always play our heaviest songs because it's okay. fun. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like sometimes we're like, man, we don't have he- we don't have enough heavy songs. We need more. You know what I mean? So it's like we're always playing the heavy songs. Um, but yeah, 2013 is when I started the band and wrote like the first songs. Okay. Um, we released the first song in 2013, but the band itself wasn't really formed until 2014. We went through a hiatus in 2016, which was didn't last very long because I don't know how to quit. And in 2017, we reformed the band and um, been just going strong ever since. So I asked that question because um, some people uh, might not know all the behind the scenes stuff that goes into live performances. Yes, there are bands that literally just walk up, plug in, play, they're done. Cool. But I asked that question because how has your live performance changed over the years? Oh, yeah, man. I mean, you know, back then we did just walk up, plug in, play and done. I remember, you know, obviously, you know, I, you know some people are going to be like, oh, we'll use tracks. Well, of course we use tracks. We've got like, you know, 30 percent of our sound is electronic. Who doesn't use tracks? We have to use tracks. So yeah. like, you know, that back in the day we had a we had a, a split left, right. We would use an iPod um, with a stereo out and then <laughs> the left was click and right was tracks. And we would patch that into a 16 channel Yamaha mixer. And then we would have ears to for, for basically just sound. They were terrible. Um, but you know what I mean? Like we'd have to roll that thing out, plug it in real quick and go, mm-hmm. you know, you know, uh, drum, drum on the carpet, you know, that type of thing. And, you know, uh, real quick, you know, and now, you know, the years of growth, we've got, you know, drum risers and production, we've got lights, we've got video screens and we've got a professional, uh, system for our in-ears and, you know, we've got live patch from soundboard at stage to soundboard at front. Like, I mean, it's crazy, like, you know, how, how it all grows and how it becomes this, this machine, man. And like, you know, um, it's really cool. It makes it a lot easier for us to perform. Um, it's expensive to get there, but it's, it's well worth it because, you know, especially if you're a vocalist, like your voice is your instrument. And if you're not on tracks as a vocalist, which we're not. So, um, you know, our vocals are, our instrument, we've got to protect them. So the easier it becomes, the the better it is for us, especially as vocalists. And there's probably an entire team behind all that stuff as well, right? Oh, dude, yeah. I mean, yeah. and the team just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, the more you add, the bigger your team gets. And without them, your show doesn't happen. You know, but I mean, I'm not exempt from being the guy who had to walk out on stage right after I was done playing and unload our gear. You know what I mean? So... You know, I couldn't wait for the day that I didn't have to be like, yeah, we love you. And then next thing I know, I'm walking off like this big rock star. And then 30 seconds later, I'm walking back out with a hood on like, I'm hoping they don't see me. You know what I mean? So like, you know, it's it's, it's a moment though. Um, And I wouldn't trade it, man, because, you know, sometimes you just gotta, you gotta work your way up. And and I, I'm a firm believer in, in artists, um, not even artists, really kind of wherever in life. If you, if you put in your dues and I, people call them dues, but for me, it's like, it's just, it's just growth, right? And and I believe in incremental growth. And I think inter- it, it, incremental growth is the strongest to, uh, staying power. And I think that like that that viral growth is really difficult, man. And I'm glad I want it now. I want viral growth because we've done the incremental growth. So like, let's blow up and let's make it happen. You know what I mean? But like, if we would have blown up like huge back then, I'm not sure that we would even really exist right now because it's so hard to maintain viral growth. So I'm glad you brought that up. Things have changed over the years, pre-COVID, post-COVID, all that stuff. Um, How do you feel maybe the festival circuit has changed over the years, especially since COVID? I don't think it has, man. I mean, you know, the year year after COVID was weird, right? Um, Yeah. You know, 2021. I mean, I guess it wasn't after COVID. I would say that it was during COVID. But, like, that that was a weird year um because of all the rules and restrictions and stuff that they had um but i don't i don't know man maybe maybe it has changed and i haven't really noticed it and maybe i've just been kind of changing along with it and it's just been incremental and i didn't know but for me i feel like it kind of just all feels the same except for we're bigger now so you know it's cool because we get a little bit better treatment 
you know, because you know, okay. it's just it's just the way it works. It's kind of like the it's kind of like the model of like uh when you're when you're at the bottom, you have to pay for everything, and then when you get to the top, everyone gives you everything for free. You know what <laughs> I mean? It's like doesn't make much sense, but um, you know, it feels cool as you as you kind of go along that path. And I'm not saying everyone gives us everything for free, but I guess what I am saying is is like we we're we're recognized now, and we've got a lot of friends now because we've been doing it for a long time. So. It's kind of like a reunion when you go to these festivals. It's like you get there and it's like, ah, what's up, man? You know, saw you last year. You know, it's cool. It's a lot of fun, man. It's like a family reunion. But uh, I don't know that's changed much, man. Kind of seems the same. Fair enough. I've noticed two things. And if you agree with me, cool. If you disagree with me, that's also cool. Remember Warp Tour? Remember back then? Oh, I do. A lot of fun then. As I go back into the festival circuit, like uh, Sonic Temple, for example, that was my... A recent festival warp tour days no one cared about personal space you were inches yeah, from the next okay. person from yeah, you. yeah. now like um I, I don't say sonic temple was sold out this year but there was like mm, plenty of thousand people there i still had room in front of me for headliners and behind me and if i wanted to leave i could it wasn't like i had to fight my way out sure. second thing i would notice the price <laughs> prices, <laughs> prices of stuff have gone up um but yeah. yeah i just wanted to get uh maybe a more professional opinion on that so thank you on that yeah um, i mean i don't really know i don't really see it from my angle um both of those i don't really see i mean obviously i've heard people talk about the price but you get me into a whole different conversation if we start talking about the price of things you know what i mean so because oh, yeah. we feel we feel it on our end too you know what i mean like it's 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 crazy um, just for example, and I'll straight up tell you, like, just for example, if you want to rent, uh, like a, the bottom grade bus, like in this industry, if you want to just get out there in a 2000 tin can, um, to try and sleep at night, the all in cost with a driver bus and fuel is going to cost you about 80 grand, um, to rent for wow. a six week tour. So, um, and you get to, to like where we're at, where we're not in a bottom end bus, but you're in, you know, you're a comfortable bus, but still not the greatest bus. You're looking at about 120 grand all in for the bus, the driver, and fuel. So, I mean, you know, like I said, we get in a whole different conversation when you want to talk about prices. Because, I mean, like, I don't really know what the festival prices were back then. This is what they are now. Um, I wasn't an avid festival goer before. Okay. Um, you know, I went to shows and stuff, but I, I had never really gone to too many festivals. Um, and the first time, I'll be honest, the first time I ever was at Warp Tour was playing Warp Tour. So, you know, I'd never, never been there as a, as a fan. Um, I'm not sure the only festival that I ever went to, let me make sure that I'm right on this. The only festival I ever went to was a uh, creation festival in 1994, three, three or four. <laughs> okay. I was I was just a baby, you know what I mean? Like I was just a kid. Yeah. So, um, but that was the only festival, so I don't really know the the ins and outs of the festival goer. What is the best way for fans to help some of their favorite musicians as far as making sure they get paid? Well, that's a deeper that's that's a deeper question than just just that, right? It it really depends on what um if the artist is on a record label or like what their deals are or mm-hmm. anything like that. I'll tell you if they're on a record label, it's not it's not music. But it does everything helps, not necessarily to get paid, but like everything helps, right? So like if your music sale numbers, if you're on a record label are high, typically you don't like for us, like we can get high numbers and we don't see any of that money gets taken from us. Um but those numbers help us in other areas, right? Because perception is everything. The music industry is one big high school popularity contest. <laughs> yep. um, you know what I mean? So, like, um, but for us, VIP. That's the okay. That's the best way. You know, we that's our that's our highest yield. Um, not only that, the the least amount of hands in the pot. Because there's a lot of people in the back end that are taking, taking, taking. Right? I mean, you, you probably thought I was going to say merch, um, which is also. <laughs> Which is also up there, but I mean, like, like, dude, I'm so transparent, right? Like, like merch, like you, so people always wonder, like, what does an artist get of merch, right? Because mm-hmm. obviously you talk about like venue merch cuts and all that stuff and then all that stuff goes viral or whatever and management and this person and that person. If you're, if you're hitting 30 to 33% in, in, um, net monies on merch, you're doing really good. Mm-hmm. 
So typically it's like 20, 25%, 25 to 28% is what an artist gets of their merchandise. And that's, Jeez. and like you said, you knew I was going to say that. That's well, the, the VIP highest. thing, VIP thing. Um, I didn't even think of that. So I'm impressed. VIP is big. Yeah. VIP is so, big, man. What do you guys offer on VIP? Generally. Everything under the sun, dude, we get the best VIPs on the planet. And I only say that because I've been told that, but I'll say it anyway. Right. Um, yeah. You know, uh, so, so yeah, you get the meet and greet, but we typically allocate like an hour, hour 15 for our VIP meet and greet. And we don't do it where we're like one person at a time, come in, hi, bye. You know what I mean? Like we do have large crowds at our VIP, but we try and cater to everybody. So like, um, what we typically offer is the meet and greet, a Q and a, um, you know, a picture with the band, you get a laminate, a couple, you typically a couple merch items you get with it. And then like, we, we typically try and do like a game, right? So like this last tour, we did darts. Um, where everyone gets a chance okay. to throw a dart at the dartboard, <laughs> and if you hit the bullseye or you score twenty, um, you win a prize. You know, so you get you get a you can get a cool prize that's uh, that's something custom, which is fun. Um, you get early entry. You know, we try we try and really throw as much into it as we possibly can because a we know that money's hard to come by for people these days. So if you're doing the right. VIP, you either have the means to do it or you're really you know, you're really working hard to get there. Um, so we want to make sure that your buck goes a long way, man. Love that answer. And it seems like you guys are right there trying to genuinely interact with fans and kind of be like old friends. Like, hey, welcome. Good to see you. Um, have a good time here. Let's play some darts, have some fun, and we're going to enjoy the show later. So very heartfelt. Very, I love that stuff. So thank you for that answer. Yeah, dude, it means what it's about, man. Like, I, I'll give you, I'll give you another little information here. So like, uh, I was doing some research lately because we were talking about stuff in the band and I'm constantly trying to motivate people. It doesn't matter if they're in the band or they're in real life. I want to motivate people to chase their dreams because I needed motivation to chase mine. And um, I learned that 0.00001% of people who per pursue professional a career in professional music make it on the other side of the age 28. 0.05% um, of those people uh, sustain it. And then 11% of the people who sustain it actually can make a living six figures or higher off of it. So like, I'm really grateful to be where I'm at. And I guess what I'm saying is, is it's, it's a really, really difficult situation to get here. Um, it's a difficult situation to stay here. And I think one of the reasons why it took me until I was 28 years old, which because 28 is when I started the band. So that's where that statistic starts. Right. Um, is because I needed to get my head straight because I wasn't in a really good headspace prior to that. And I got my head straight and I started when I was 28, beat all those odds, beat all those statistics. But one of the things that it's allowed me to do is stay grounded. And it's allowed me to to view things differently than maybe if I would have become super famous when I was a kid. You know, I may have viewed other people outside of my fame as, you know, inferior to me or me being superior. And I'm, I'm only speaking on... Um, seeing that myself or hearing fans talk about, well, I got, got famous and the next thing you know, he was a dick. You know what I mean? So it's like, I'm really kind of grateful that it took me to that point because I see everybody is like, just like a homie. Like, it doesn't really matter to me. Like if it, you're a fan or a colleague or whatever, like I'm no better than you. Like what makes me better, a better person because I have a microphone and I go up on a stage in front of a thousand people. That, that doesn't make me superior to anybody. You know what I mean? Like, so, you know, someone in that crowd might be a heart doctor. Their job is equally as important or more important than mine. You know what I mean? But that doesn't make them inferior because I have a microphone and they don't. So, so yeah, man, we want to give our fans everything, treat them like they're, they're, they're one of the group, man. They're, they're, they're the homies, you know what I mean? And that's what we do in VIP. And that's what we try to do every time we see people is just, you know, we're just homies. That's the best answer. I love it. Um, we're going to slowly start wrapping things up. Um, I want to know what's next for um, From Ashes to New after incarceration. Um, well, we got a couple festivals, right? And then we'll have festivals this fall. We've got a tour with nothing more uh, um, September, October, and that's going to go right into a, a co-bill with um, Set It Off in October Damn. and November. So, so we've got a busy fall. Um, so yeah, man, it's a busy year. You know, we're going to work on writing new music. Um, and hopefully, you know, we'll get something together and, and release something new, maybe the end of the year, beginning of the next year. We'll see where we're at with it. But, uh, 
Busy, 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 man. Just keep on working. I always like to wrap things up with one question kind of at the end here. Do you have any advice for up and coming bands that, you know, maybe want to get to where you're at one day? Fuck the outside noise, man. Who cares? You know, like who don't don't look. I spent so long looking and, and a lot of people do this and some of the people around me are still doing this. I spent so long looking at other artists and going, why do they have what I want and why don't I have it? But every time that I focus on just me and stop focusing on what everybody else is doing is when I experience the best wins of my career. So don't focus outside anything. I mean, you can you you can have inspiration. You can have people that you look up to. And that's great because you're looking at it at a positive mindset. Like look at it as like, you know, for example, if you look at a band like, and I'll just use Bring Me the Horizon, a band that crushes in our industry. If you look at a band like Bring Me the Horizon and you go, man, they're so good. Like, man, you know, like everything they do is so great. Ollie's yep. such a great singer. Like, I love that band and I just can't wait to either share a stage with them, play a festival with them, or just listen to their new music when they release it. If you look at it with that mindset and you're doing the same thing, that is incredibly powerful. If you look at it the other way and you go, man, bring me the horizon. Why do they get everything that I don't? What makes them so much better than me? You know, you start doing that's a That's a dangerous path. Two that's different mindsets. Yep. Yeah, man. So like, and that, that doesn't mean that you don't like a band, like bring me the horizon. That just means that you're jealous of them. And you know, it's okay to have a shred of jealousy, but when you let it consume you, it will destroy you. Any final things you want to say to fans? Not much love. You know what I mean? Like we are, it, it, you know, and it's cliche, right? We're, we're here. We're here because of you and everyone said, but I mean it, you know what I mean? Like, so and I'm not saying that other bands don't just play people who mean it. Um, so, you know, if you if you listen to an artist or you watch an artist and you go, man, that artist is a dick, um, you know, they're probably going to hit every branch on the way down. You know what I mean? It's, it sucks that, that people go out there and think that it's just because of them that they're doing what they're doing. But the reality is it's, it's a it's a 50 50 thing. Right. The artist has got to do what the artist has got to do. The fan has also got to do what the fans got to do. And we've been here for as long as we've been here because the fans have taken us to where we are. We haven't had. And not every moment of, moment of ours has been a perfect moment. We've gone through some really hard times as artists, um, and we've had our ups and downs. But even when we've had our worst times, our fans have lifted us up. And without them, man, this doesn't exist. My life doesn't exist the way that it does. My family doesn't have what my family has without the fans. And coming from a guy who grew up with nothing, no money, no silver spoon, living in a, a two-bedroom apartment, splitting a room with his sister right down the middle. Coming from a guy like that, man, it means everything to me to be able to give my family what I'm able to give my family. And the fans are the ones who give me the opportunity to do that. So I love them. They are the best. They mean everything to me in my life. Matt, it was an absolute pleasure speaking with you. Um, I can't wait to see you guys. Uh, hopefully, I get to run into you and take a picture with you and shake your hand or something. Um, I'm going to talk to you here in a bit off air, okay? Cool, man. Yeah, just uh, if you see me at the festival, I am I am oblivious a lot, just to let you know. <laughs> just meandering around. So if you see me, um, just come up, dude. Say what's up. All right, guys, that's Matt from Ashes to New. They're going to be playing Sunday, July 21st at Incarceration Fest on the Yard Stage at 145. So you got to be there. They got a re-deluxe album out right now, so you got to make sure you check that out. They got all kinds of stuff happening with the rest of 2024. I appreciate you checking out this episode of the podcast. We'll see you guys next time.